Ten years before, early in the Depression, the bank at which John Lomax worked failed. He had to phone all his customers to tell them their investments were worthless. Unemployed and with a family to support, he slumped into a depression of his own. But he pulled through and made history by returning to an early passion when he'd published a groundbreaking collection of cowboy songs. In 1933, with a car boot full of the very latest recording equipment supplied by the Library of Congress, he set off with his 18-year-old son, Alan, scouring southern prisons for traditional black songs. They thought they'd hit the jackpot when they came across Leadbelly. He had a huge repertoire of songs. Then he was recognized in the prison. He was asked to come out and entertain sometimes. I think Leadbelly recognized in my grandfather somebody who could help him advance his musical career. He wanted to be a successful, popular musician, and this had long been his ambition from childhood. John Lomax saw the prisons as time capsules, uncontaminated by the modern world and its commercial music. He believes when you put black people in isolation, they will revert back to the music that they'd grown up with, the songs of their childhood, the real black music, before all this modern technology came along. Leadbelly did sing old songs in an old style, but he also listened to the pop songs of the day. When Leadbelly got out of Angola State Penitentiary, he was released on good time, not because he made a record for the governor, which was kind of the myth that he, both he and my grandfather allowed to circulate because it made a good story. Oh, Alberto. Oh, Alberto. Tell me what in the hell you mean. It was at this hotel in Marshall, Texas, that Leadbelly met John Lomax in 1934 on his release from prison. Leadbelly wrote to grandfather asking him for a job. He wrote Leadbelly back, be here, bring your driver's license and guitar. Oh, Alberto. Oh, Alberto. Come on. Don't you hear me calling you? And that's where they set off on this historic trip around the South where Leadbelly acted as his assistant and driver. Three times seven, you know, just what you want, it was highly unusual in that time and place for white and black to work together. You had to be really careful because if you were seen to be stirring up trouble, so to speak, you know, that was a very tense period. They did get Lead Belly into their hotel sometimes. They would sneak him in. But that was absolutely not permissible. Lomax was a showman, and he couldn't resist writing to his friends in New York and saying, you know, I found this phenomenal singer, and, you know, wait till you hear him. So he got a couple of invitations, actually, bizarrely, from the Modern Language Association, this collection of English professors. Take this animal and carry it to the captain. And in between a session on Elizabethan madrigals and a session on sea shanties, John Lomax stood and delivered a lecture about Negro folk song, and Leadbelly performed the numbers. It was absolutely electric. You tell him I'm gone. You tell him I'm gone. This was very revolutionary, just even to talk about black song, let alone have a real, actual person get up there and do it and the story of Lead Belly, that he was a former convict and that he had sung his way out of prison. That caused a big stir. 
hailed by the Library of Congress's music division as its greatest folk song find in 25 years, Led Belly songs go into the archives of the great national institution, along with the Declaration of Independence. And that wasn't all. Led Belly, what are you doing here? Led Belly, what are you doing here? Boss, I've come here to be your man. I've come here to wait for you the rest of my life. The newsreels made a scripted reconstruction of their first meeting. It was shown in cinemas before the main feature. All right, Led Belly, I'll try it. Thank you, sir, boss. Thank you, sir, boss. I'll drive you all over the United States. I'll tie your shoestring for you. And you never know have to tie your shoestring as long as I work for you. And I'll sing all songs for you. You'll be my big boss and I'll be your man. Right. Thank you, sir, right. boss. Thank all you, right. sir. Thank you, sir. My grandfather was very patriarchal, domineering, complicated, sentimental. <laughs> no doubt he bossed told Lead Belly what to do, but he told everyone what to do. The Lomaxes took Lead Belly on a tour around some northern colleges. The Lomax would give him what money they thought he should have in his pocket. Well, now Lead Belly got tired of that. Just degrading. He was very degrading. He said, I got tired of Lomax giving me money like I'm a little boy. Like, uh, they go out and buy some candy or something. He said, that's why I, I left. It was a very unpleasant um, fight that they had, and that was the end of that. My, my grandfather was offended forever and ever. She's a rider. She what you done done. They'd worked together for only eight months, but between them, they'd achieved something remarkable, the redefinition of American folk. Suddenly you had this idea. Folk music was not just genteel old songs from the mountains or nostalgic songs from the plantation south. Folk music had a kind of edge to it. Folk music was outsider music. It was sung by Negro prisoners on chain gangs, by all kinds of outcasts. That was the, the world that Lead Belly's songs conjured up. It was just one step away from saying folk music was actually about protesting the way things were. Yeah. You say that I'm an outlaw, you say that I'm a thief. Here's a Christmas dinner for the families on relief. The man who would fit this new mold perfectly was Woody Guthrie. But a many a starving farmer, the same old story told. Every year this festival is held in the town where he was born. How the outlaw paid their mortgage and saved their little home. I'll do anything, anywhere, anytime for my brother Woody Guthrie. I'm tickled to death if I can be here for that little scrounging rascal. <laughs> He was very small. He was very small. Slender. Little bitty legs and little bitty arms. Woody it made you feel like that you were very special. And when Woody talked, you listened. Yes, it's through this world I've rambled. I've seen lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. A drifter, a rebel, always siding with the down and outs. Woody was known only to a small radical audience and never had a hit record. Now he's seen as a national treasure. He was a classic American archetype. It was every teenage American boy's dream of running away from home, seeing what's over the next hill. The clever little guy. He was the clever little guy with a social conscience. In a sense, Woody was his own invention. He was born middle class. His father was a land speculator and a local politician. But the family fell apart. Is my firstborn child. Woody's father went bankrupt, and his mother was shut away as insane, though in fact she had Huntington's career. Age 14, Woody was left to fend for himself. Oh, if you ain't got the do re me folks, you ain't got the do re me 
because Woody was an underdog himself, he began to identify with other people who were poor and oppressed. The Depression had destroyed farmers' livelihoods, and now the Dust Bowl destroyed their land. A great movement started out to California, where there were migrant farm worker jobs. Woody joined the Drift West. This is when he wrote his first song. So long, it's been good to know you. So long, been good to know you. So long, it's been good to know you. This dusty old dust is a blowing me home. I've got to be rolling along. They stopped you at the California border and said, do you have any money? And he went, uh, wait a second, isn't this America? I didn't realize I needed a visa to go across the California border. Once he started saying, I wonder why it's like this, the feelings started planting ideas in his head, which started coming out as words and language of his music. So been good to know you. When I was in high school, and I listened to So Long It's Been Good to Know You, and I thought, my God, this guy can't sing at all. He's a terrible singer. But I love his songs. It took me a while to learn to like music with the bark still on it. And the rustlers broke on us In the dead hours of night She rose from her warm bed A battle He knew how to put words together and make it be meaningful and poetic. A rich collection of uh, slang words that uh, came from oil well drilling and gamblers that they sing about in the blues and in the cowboy songs. And fight for your land. It's not the way they speak in New York City. Come all of you cowboys and don't ever run as long as there's bullets in both of your guns. Woody's songs fitted the mood of the times. I am prepared to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. When Franklin Roosevelt became president, he immediately implemented the New Deal to create work despite the Depression, and folk music was expected to spread the word. In the 1920s, folk music had been built around a nostalgia for a pastoral, rural world. By the 1930s, that phrase, folk music, gains a different sort of electricity about it, and it's hijacked, I suppose, by the left. At first, the left had dreamed of modern classical music as the path to a bright future. Pete Seeger was from a well-off New York family, both his parents were classical musicians who wanted to take music to the people. My father was in a group called the Composers Collective. After all, in Russia they had collective farms. Why not have a Composers Collective in New York? But the proletariat was not interested in their songs. My father brought a Kentucky miner's wife to the meeting of the collective and she sang, I am a union woman, just brave as I can be. I do not like the bosses, and bosses don't like me. When my husband works in the coal mine, he loads a car on every trip. The other composer said, Charlie, this is the music of the past. We're supposed to be creating the music of the future. And my father said to her, I'm sorry they didn't understand you, but I know some young people are going to want to learn your songs, and I was one of them. 